Kia ora koutou everybody, good afternoon. Today there are 9,495 new community cases of COVID-19 across Aotearoa. And again today, it is good to see that we're seeing an ongoing decline in our seven-day rolling average of cases. There are 551 people in hospital, uh, 27 of those are in ICU. Sadly today, the Ministry of Health is reporting a further 15 deaths from COVID-19. Everyone's sympathies will be the families, uh, with the families who have suffered from those losses. Uh, as always, further details on those case numbers will be provided uh, in the 1pm written update from the Ministry and released on the Ministry of Health's website. It's been three weeks since we simplified the traffic light systems. In that time, we've opened up outdoor gatherings to unlimited numbers and increased indoor gatherings to 200. We've also removed vaccine mandates for most workforces and ended the requirements around vaccine passes, though businesses can still continue to use those if they wish to. Despite this significant relaxation in the settings, we've continued to see positive improvements in the overall trajectory of our COVID-19 Omicron outbreak. Since the last review of the settings 10 days ago, the seven-day rolling average of cases has now declined by 3,930. Uh, and case numbers now sit at under 10,000 cases a day for the first time since the 24th of February. Hospitalisations are also trending down, with over 100 fewer people on average in hospital across the country now than when we last reviewed the settings. Importantly, hospitalisation in Auckland, where we know there's been significant pressure, uh, has increased remarkably. For the first time since late February, all three Auckland hospitals are each reporting fewer than 100 patients with COVID-19 currently in hospital. Uh, and the extra good news is that planned care delivery is increasing day by day. And the decline in cases and hospitalisations, uh, along with the arrival of new antiviral medications, means that the number of deaths is now also declining from a seven-day rolling average of 20 a week to 13 now. So, uh, right across the country, the evidence is clear that the actions we have sustained mean that we're now coming off the peak and we're now well on the other side of it. In some places, the cases are falling off quickly, in others, they're plateauing and experiencing a slightly slower decline, but the overall picture is a very positive one. So on that basis, our COVID-19 ministers have confirmed that the whole of New Zealand will move to the orange traffic light setting from 11.59pm tonight, Wednesday the 13th of April, and time for the school holidays and for the Easter weekend. So a quick recap of what does orange mean. There are no indoor or outdoor capacity limits, and the seated and separated rule for hospitality is removed, so bars, cafes and restaurants will be able to fill up again. Face masks remain an important protection against COVID-19. Uh, research shows that they can reduce transmission by up to 50%. So they'll continue to play a, a very important role in keeping case numbers down. At Orange, they remain an important protection. Uh, for this reason, we, we continue to encourage the use of face masks when people are out and about in public, including on flights, retail, public transport, and in public facilities like libraries. For workers, face masks are, are, are still required at some gatherings and events, close proximity businesses like hairdressers uh, and food and drink businesses. At schools, face masks are not required, but are encouraged, and further guidance is being provided to schools. Where schools are experiencing an acute outbreak of COVID-19 cases, they may introduce a local school requirement for masks to be worn for a period of time. We've also, uh, as I went through yesterday uh, in, the, in Parliament, uh, been providing more guidance to schools around ventilation and how they can better use ventila ventilation to reduce the transmission in a school setting. There are no changes to the seven-day self-isolation requirement. So if you or someone you live with gets COVID-19, you'll still be required to isolate. Isolation remains one of the best ways that we can break chains of transmission. The next review of the traffic light settings will happen in mid-May. Uh, however, as we approach the winter months, I do want to be clear here that we could well see an additional surge in influenza and potentially in COVID-19. Uh, and so that will inform the decisions we make in the future. Uh, I've got one final message, and that is now everybody can do all of the things that they've been able to do all along to protect themselves uh, and to protect their whānau. 
So wearing a mask when out and about, particularly when in an indoor environment where you can't socially distance from others, staying home if unwell, making sure that you are up to date with vaccinations. And if you haven't yet been boosted, please get boosted. We've got about a million New Zealanders who are eligible who haven't taken up that opportunity. Uh, the evidence is pretty clear that New Zealand has fared better in our dealing with the Omicron outbreak than many other countries because of the high rates of vaccination that we've achieved uh, as a team. And so I'd encourage people who haven't taken up the opportunity to get boosted to do so. So as we move into this next state or stage of our response, uh, having survived uh, the worst without experiencing the worst, um, well, no one can be certain of what's ahead, and we know that new variants are emerging overseas and we'll continue to keep a close eye on that. Uh, but we can look forward to, I hope, uh, school holidays with a little more normality than we've experienced uh, in recent times. That. How much of this was a political decision around setting people free for the school holidays? Uh, look, um, probably the only uh, difference there was a, a question of about 24 hours in timing, whether we did it from, uh, you know, uh, from tonight or from tomorrow night. Ultimately, the case numbers and um, what we were seeing in terms of hospitalisation was the thing that drove the decision. Um, I pushed a bit harder to get the, uh, all of the administration ready earlier so that we could do it from tonight, just to give people that extra lead time. Um, but ultimately, it, the evidence is stacks up very strongly in favour of the move to Orange. Masking in schools. Why have you left that up to schools? Why not um, extend that mask and that like a lot of um, a lot of epidemiologists and. and paediatricians have been calling for? Look, it won't be justified in all cases any, any, any longer. In some cases, schools will have had a COVID-19 outbreak that will, be, will have passed, and so they will have you know, high rates of vaccination or high rates of natural immunity through people who have had COVID-19. Uh, others might not be experiencing outbreaks at all. So um, it does move to a more localised response from schools. One, the schools. Industry, the one industry that, that this really affects, hospitality, is going to face a weekend where Easter trading restrictions are in place instead of COVID restrictions. Did Cabinet consider at all removing those restrictions just for this year? No, um, we didn't, but it, it was one of the factors that informed the decision to move from midnight tonight as opposed to from midnight tomorrow night so that they at least get a bit of a, a, bit of a lead time. Can you clarify the rules around mask wearing? You mentioned that on flights it's no longer compulsory, is that right? It's um, encouraged. Uh, Ultimately, airlines, of course, can set their own um, policies around vaccination and mask use, um, but uh, the, the rules have changed uh, around what is what was required by us. Um, so uh, we're still encouraging them on uh, flights and public transport. What about, what about um, retail and, and shops and that sort of thing? And given the point you keep making about how effective mask wearing is, why not keep those stronger advices in place when you're opening up in other areas? Look, there is still a requirement in many more places for there to be mask use, so I'd encourage people to familiarise themselves with that, uh, but it won't be as widespread as it has been up until now. So is the no, is the, apart from those workers that you mentioned, is there no sort of compulsory requirement now to wear a mask anywhere? Um, yes, no, there are still some areas, and as I've mentioned, um, uh, we're still, uh, there are still some requirements around some workforces, for example, to be using masks. Now, if you're out and about, if you're in a shop, I'm talking sort of more from like a, I suppose, a consumer or community point of view, you don't have to wear it on a flight, you don't have to wear it in a shop or anything like that, it's just encouraged now, is that correct? Yeah, no, sorry, I, I, for some reason I didn't bring the exact list when we, when we made those orange settings, we set all of that out, um, and for some reason I didn't bring that with me, so I'm happy to uh, make sure that that list is, what, is well distributed. Address the risk though, like for example on flights, we've got school holidays, we're going to have a lot of people flying around um, you know, in airports and in confined spaces of flights. Isn't that a risk just in terms of the timing and suddenly saying you don't have to wear a mask anymore? Uh, sorry, run that one past me again. So if we're going into school holidays and if masks are no longer mandatory from the government side on flights, for example, isn't that a place where transmission, it's a high risk transmission area, why not keep the mask advice a bit stronger, even through orange? while you're opening up, like, gathering limits and that sort of thing? Let, let me come... I'll come back to you in a few moments, just on mask use and on flights in particular. So just, just give me a few so, minutes so, on so, that. So when are you required to wear a face mask now? Um, there are some workforces that are required to wear a face mask, and it's strongly encouraged for others. So, so, so you don't have to wear a face mask at the supermarket anymore? Uh, no.
Is your expectation for schools and masks, essentially, okay. unless they have a good reason not to be using masks, they should be? Sorry, just give me one minute. Yeah. I, um, I've just got masks are still a requirement on uh, public transport, so including flights. Okay. Sorry, my script, so was a little, my, my script was a little unclear about that, I understand. So, so can we just clarify then? So mask wearing on public transports, including flights, and I mean, I, I stand to be corrected, but I thought it was still in retail as well. Let, um, let me just triple check that I'm correct, and I'll come back to you on that in a moment. So I just didn't bring the list. list. It, was a, it was several weeks ago we made that decision around masks, so let me just double check that I'm getting it absolutely correct for you, um, and I will... I'll, yeah. So if you just give me a few minutes, um, the advice will come through. I'll be clear on that. So we'll do some other questions in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask you for a point of clarification? You said today, tragically, 15 people have died from COVID. Did they die from it or with it? Uh, at the moment, it's with COVID-19. You said from, so... Uh, no, well, it, it, the, the official statistics reflect people who have died with COVID-19. Um, there is a, then a review um, to, to look at exactly what the cause of death was, so... Yeah, Minister, pe um, if people are visiting their elderly relatives in um, rest care facilities this weekend, should they be wearing face masks and adhering to physical distancing? Um, I'm, I'm just getting uh, the, the absolute list, so I'm just waiting for the absolute list to come through, just because I don't want to uh, give people guidance that is incorrect. Um, I acknowledge that the script that I used probably wasn't as clear as it should have been, so I'm just getting, I don't want to go into specific situations. So just give me a minute to get the full list through, and then I'll go through the full list of when it is and isn't required. Um, so and has Kevin uh, made any changes to the mask? No, there's anything? been no changes to what was previously announced, but I don't want to go into the specifics of that without the list in front of me in case I uh, get one or two of the settings wrong. So uh, the list should be through any minute now. Does it make sense then if you don't have to wear a mask in a hospitality outlet where there can be a limitless crowd on a dance floor uh, with people within this close to each other, does it make sense to keep masks in when you're going shopping at the supermarket? They are. They are. So, uh, look, I'll, I'll come back to you on... Should, can we just park masks for a moment? Give me a minute on masks, and then we'll come back to that. Yeah. Just to keep on masks just for a little bit longer. <laughs> well, no, I'm not going to ask any... Just, a yeah, I need a few minutes on masks, so I'm happy to come back to that. Jens uh, was saying you should oh, On schools, I can definitely talk about that. Schools yeah. Until the end of winter. Yeah. Right? Help at least get through to the end of winter. Why, you know, did you not consider that? Or did you consider that? Yes, we did. We absolutely considered the requirements around masks use in schools. Um, and ultimately, and you know, winter. looking at a school by school basis, in some schools there is still a very strong justification for masks, but not all. And so, uh, hence, we have made the decision there that schools will be able to make their own decisions around mask use. Recognising, again, that there's, there's implications there around age cohorts and so on. Um, it, it is very challenging for schools. It has proven to be one of the most challenging COVID-19 requirements um, for schools to be um, enforcing. So, the best place to be making that call, if there is a very strong justification, are they the best in the best position to be making that call about whether masks should be mandatory? Uh, I think we've, we've provided guidance to them and of course they have access to public health guidance as well so that they can consider their particular circumstances and situations. Data around transmission at schools through Omicron outbreak? Um, Anecdotal, we know that most schools in the country have had COVID-19 cases and that there's been transmission as a result of those cases. I don't have a specific number in front of me about that. Is that something though that you want to look at? You know, because anecdotally, there's a lot of cases coming out of schools and then taking it home. You know, it's a potential vector for transmission. Isn't that something you should have data on when you make these, like, mask decisions, for example, about whether they're warranted or not? Um, we don't collect through our um, through our, our testing collection, the, and, and we don't investigate now in the way that we did previously the source of transmission for every COVID-19 case. So when someone reports their rapid antigen test result, we don't determine whether they, uh, were they given COVID by someone in their household or whether they're given COVID-19 by someone at school or, or whatever. So it's mostly kind of anecdotal data that we have now as opposed to hard data. You can't collect because of the different, the change in contact tracing and, and recording. That's right. Well, it, I, we, we, will have, we will have some data. I don't have it with me at the moment because um, a, a reasonable number of people fill in the contact tracing form. But again, a lot of people are not filling that contact tracing form. And so when, they, when you declare your positive result, um, we, um, we then send you a form which you fill in. Um, so we have some data. I'll, I'll, look, I'll get the data to you for, for what we have. Uh, Minister, you mentioned before um, with the next decision, 
you know, there could be things like the influenza, the influenza outbreak, influencing that decision. Um, can you just uh, talk about if, if uh, other infectious diseases could be, I guess, incorporated into the traffic light system, and so we could be in a situation where there's few COVID cases, but we're seeing high influenza cases. You, you, we would you still be looking to retain um, the traffic light system? And um, yes, we are retaining the traffic light system. Yes. And sorry, yeah, I, no, I, I do have the updated list now, and I have refreshed uh, my memory of them. Uh, and I was incorrect on retail, so my apologies for that. Yes, you still do need to wear uh, a mask in, in a retail setting. So retail, public transport. But, and retail and public transport are, are the two main ones. There are some other indoor areas like courts or tribunals, um, and the uh, and local government premises. Um, and when visiting healthcare services, which would include aged residential care facilities. Should you be across that data? Um, look, I just had a bit of a mind blank there, so I do apologise. That is my mistake. I, I will own that one. There's 9,000 cases today, 15 deaths. Is that the sort of normal level that you expect, or do you expect that to come down further? Sorry, the... Just 9,000 9, cases, 15 deaths. Is that the... Um, it's still trending down, and so we, um, I'm optimistic that it will continue to trend down. Um, but, you know, it's, um, the, the modelling would suggest that it will continue to trend down, but, you know, there's, there's always the possibility that we'll see an increase. If Minister, if Minister if coming back to Michael's um, question, the traffic light system, will it be specifically used uh, for influ influenza? Uh, it would depend on the relationship with, with COVID-19 cases as well. well. Will will they be seen together when it if, comes if to... If we have a double whammy where we see another spike in COVID-19 cases and a spike in influenza cases, then yes, that will inform the decisions we make about our traffic light settings. But, but let's say there's, there's, there's barely any COVID cases and we're seeing a spike in influenza. Could you use the traffic light system? And if so, is that disingenuous to the, to the whole traffic light system in the context of COVID? The traffic light system is a COVID-19 framework. Minister, how many um, New Zealanders do you think have actually had COVID and how big a factor is the anticipated natural immunity in today's decision? Very hard to tell um, because, you know, there will be people who either didn't know they had COVID-19 or didn't report their, their results. Um, it could be significantly more than the official statistics are showing. Um, What's the highest uh, possible number, do you think? Is it 1.52 million? Because we've heard... It could be around the 2 million marker by now. Um, uh, look, your, your your crystal ball in terms of you know guess, guessing that is is just as good as the the modellers. They, they um, uh, but the modelling suggests you know the outer limits would be that sort of in that one point seven to one point seven to two million kind of range at, at the at the upper end. It may be less than that. And was that a significant? How, how significant a factor was that in, in the decision that you made today? Uh, Overall, the case numbers that we've got, the level of vaccination that we've got, those were the bigger things that we were um, looking at today. Will the COVID support payments for businesses continue under Orange? Uh, we are moving to a... And look, the Minister of Finance is the one to talk in detail about this, but I want to be... Uh, you know, I think we, we've all been clear that we are moving to an environment where those payments are being phased out um, and the move to Orange has an implication for that. What about, what about like the leave payments and that sort of thing when, when we're um, I don't have a detailed list of, of every payment because there's a lot of things that we've been doing to support people who are who are um, you know isolating due to COVID-19. Happy to provide you the list of what continues at Orange and what doesn't. I just don't have that with me. Minister, well, Minister, Minister can you explain the, the, green. Can you explain, can you explain the, the difference um, between a hospitality venue and a retail venue? in terms of why masks would be required at one and not another. It would make sense if the vaccine pass, which I suspect is why this is originally designed, because you wouldn't need a vaccine pass in a retail outlet, but you don't need them in the either now. So people can mix, they can sing, they can be as close as they like in a hospitality venue with no masks. But if they go to a supermarket or the warehouse, they have to wear a mask the entire time. It doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, in a hospitality venue, you'll typically be consuming food and drink. So, you know, um, that, that actually makes the use of masks when, with the seated and separated rule no longer in place, that makes the use of masks um, less effective or less useful um, because people, you know, people drinking and walking around wouldn't be wearing masks and other people would be. In retail, people aren't going to be consuming food and drink. So you can have people pashing on a dance floor, but I have to wear a mask to go to the supermarket. 
Uh, at the moment, you still have to wear a mask in a retail environment. That is correct. What? Where is your logic on that? Uh, ultimately, it's a question of volume. There are going to be fewer. There are going to be a lot more people in the supermarket on a on a weekly basis than there'll be out and about pashing on a dance floor. The likelihood that New Zealand will see a green setting this year, or at least this, after this winter. Um, I've never put odds on any of those things, and I don't intend to start doing that now. What about what's the biggest difference that New Zealanders will see from moving to Orange? Is it being able to dance on the dance floor, those indoor venues? What do you think is the biggest changes? I think, yeah, clearly the biggest change is the ability to have larger numbers of people indoors. What? Minister, people like Michael Baker have said that uh, the rest of New Zealand shouldn't move to Orange, only Auckland should. So is it fair to say this is based on public health advice? Um, yes, it is based on the public health advice that we've relied on and all the decisions that we've made, which is from the, the public health teams at the Ministry of Health. Uh, all the way through the pandemic, there have been other public health experts who have, who have held different views. Um, and of course, we, we, we hear them, um, we listen to them, um, but the, the ultimate public health advice that we receive comes through the Ministry of Health. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister yes. has previously recognised that the self-exemption criteria and the um, process to do that for masks has been a real sticking point, especially for retail who are getting a lot of abuse. Have you made any decisions about that or firmed that up so that those retail workers aren't getting abused? Yes, I mean, we're working really closely with the disability community around that. I haven't got an announcement to make on that uh, immediately, but we are uh, hoping to be in a position to announce some changes there to make that an easier system to use um, and one that's easier for retail as well. Um, so yes, there's, there's been quite a lot of work there. Um, I acknowledge that um, some of the disability community have found the existing system quite traumatic as well. Um, and so we're working closely with them to, to get a better process in place there. When we, when can we expect Expect that um, soon, within the next couple of weeks, I hope. Um, but I just don't have anything today to be able to announce on that. What level You've been of working COVID on it since August last year, haven't you? What, look, it's been a, it's been a work in progress. Yes. What level of COVID cases and deaths would be acceptable to you on an ongoing basis? Um, I think we we there's no there's no such thing as an acceptable rate of death when you're dealing with an infectious disease. Um, there. <laughs> We do everything that we can to lower the death rate to as close to zero as we can possibly get it, but acknowledging that getting to absolutely zero uh, is impossible. I mean, you're not doing everything you can. Theoretically, you could stay at red, right? So there's, there's a, a decision that you're making here. You're weighing up cases and deaths and hospitalizations and long COVID, and you're weighing up something else as well. So I'm just wondering, at what point do you get to that equilibrium? We do. We have been monitoring. Um, look, I get, get that this is a very sensitive topic. We have been monitoring the level of um, people dying in um, in all of the different demographics and how that compares to what we would normally see in a, any given year. And at the moment, um, we're not seeing you know a significant. We are seeing an increase on what we would normally see, but it is not an ex, you know it's not a, it's not a massive increase in what we would normally see. Is your sort of level of acceptable when there's no longer sort of excess deaths, essentially? That's certainly what we'd be aiming for, yes. Minister, yeah. Minister just as Leader of the House, do you want to see a Vladimir Zelensky address New Zealand's Parliament? Um, I think it's somewhat undiplomatic and almost embarrassing for the New Zealand Parliament to move a motion like that without speaking to the Ukrainian President to see whether or not he wants to address the New Zealand Parliament. So... Uh, I think if the New Zealand Parliament was going to pass such a motion, we would only do that after we'd established that that was something that the Ukrainian president would actually uh, welcome. Do you think we should make an approach to the uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian I'm not familiar with whether an approach has been made or not, um, Barry, um, but certainly our, our government, including our Prime Minister, has been in regular contact with both the President and the Prime Minister of the Ukraine. Um, they are well aware of the New Zealand support, and certainly I, uh, if, they, if the President wanted to address the New Zealand Parliament, there would be no impediment other than cross-party agreement, which I'm sure we would be able to secure, to that happening. It has happened before. Julia Gillard addressed us, albeit in person, rather than via an electronic link. Um, but I certainly think you know, that would be available as an option. But I think issuing a formal um, invitation by a motion in Parliament without first checking whether the person you're inviting is actually... Um, receptive to that, um, I don't know that that's the sort of politicking that we want to see in a situation like this. Would you like to see it? I, I would welcome it if that was what the Ukrainian president wanted to do. 
but I don't think that New Zealand's Parliament should pass a resolution effectively requiring it uh, without talking to him about it first. Do you think, uh, on the back of that, kind of, that there would be a benefit of him addressing New Zealand's Parliament, or it wouldn't kind of give us a better picture anyway? Look, he's a busy guy. Um, I think we've got to acknowledge that there's quite a lot happening for him at the moment, um, and I wouldn't want to put him in a position where we formally issued an invitation, which he then felt he either had to do despite not having the time to do it, uh, or had to turn down. And so, uh, you know, I think this is one where we do have to rely on some diplomacy here, um, rather than the politicking that is clearly evident in the fact that that motion has been put on Parliament's order paper. Can I just go back to the traffic lights? So, uh, what consultation did you have with Māori and... Uh, how receptive were they to having the traffic lights changed? We've considered really closely uh, at every step of our decision making around COVID-19 the impact on Māori communities, uh, where things sit um, in terms of the outbreak and how it's affecting Māori communities, how it's affecting our Pacifica communities uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, we have had regular feedback from our iwi leaders, um, from the various other forum, our Māori health providers, um, all have provided regular feedback on what they are seeing and how they are experiencing uh, the outbreak. Um, so um, in terms of the, the question of consultation, um, there hasn't been consultation around these sorts of decisions um, with any of the groups that we would normally consult with because of the sort of constraints that we have, but we've certainly received feedback from groups. So going forward then, will you not be consulting with Māori going forward on any other issue to do with this strategy? But the word right. consultation in a public sector sense has a particular type of meaning, um, and we haven't run formal consultation processes around alert level decisions or around decisions about where we sit on the COVID-19 protection framework. Um, the time constraints around that certainly would make that very difficult, uh, but similarly, um, you know, we're relying on our public health advice in making these decisions. That's not to say, though, um, that we haven't received feedback and that we haven't taken that feedback on board. We absolutely have. Oh, so just, just to be clear, then, you will not be consulting, but you will... We'll continue to receive point. feedback um, from Māori communities. We'll continue to engage with them and we'll continue to have conversations with them, absolutely. And just one more question about mandatory vaccinations, then, for those uh, that are still in place... They won't be changing? No, there's no changes uh, to that at this point. Is there a date for the next review? Uh, yes, I indicated that, I think, at mid-May. I, I can't remember whether I gave you a specific date in my uh, talking points, but mid-May. Do you think if the COVID-19 response minister is pretty confused about where you can and don't have to wear masks, that the public will be able to understand... Um, look, that, that was my mistake. I, I did not refresh my memory sufficiently about mask requirements at Orange uh, before I came down here. I apologise for that. Uh, that was my mistake. The guidance is very clear. Um, yes, I should have been familiar with that guidance before I came to do this. Um, I will accept responsibility for the fact that I did not do that. Um, it's been quite a lot going on. Is, it, is, it, is the guidance logical? Yes, it is, because it's based overall on the quantum of risk that we are trying to reduce. At a museum, but not a nightclub. Uh, again, like I said, food and drink, the serving of food and drink is the, is the differentiating point between those types of settings. But it's not in schools, right? What's that? But it's not in schools. You're schools are a different right? environment. You know, schools, you still know who's been in a school. You, there's, there's a lot of different things that can happen in a school. Kids are still largely contained within a relatively fixed group. Um, and that is very different from a museum where people are wandering around amongst potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of people all at the same time. Hundreds, if not, uh, hundreds if not thousands, of people are allowed in nightclubs. I just, uh, do, do you understand? Do you understand why that? that yes, I, yes, I do. Like a um, but, but I don't know that um, we would receive a lot of compliance if we tried to get people wearing masks in a nightclub or a bar. Compliance rather than, rather than actual health advice. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a set of decisions that allows us to reopen that part of the hospitality industry, yes. Are you expecting this will lead to super spreader events? Uh, I think people do need to be aware um, that there will be more risk in going into those types of environments um, than there is if they're going to the supermarket. And I think that people will make those own choices and decisions for themselves. Is the system still fit for purpose with, um, you know, this new variant was made during Delta and stuff? Is it doing much anymore? Yes, it is. It's, I mean, mask, mask use, um, and there will still be mask use in quite a, a range of environments, does turn down the risk by about 50%. 
Can you just clarify, because there will be a lot of people visiting their granny or 90-year-old uncle this, this Easter weekend. When they go to the old age home, uh, what guidance or rules should they be following? Is it, is it ad hoc for each aged care facility? Um, there appears to be some so-called guidance on the Ministry of Health website, but it's not apparent what, what the rules are. Well, aged residential care facilities, of course, are by and large private facilities, um, and so they get to determine their own rules of admission, uh, as they have right the way through the pandemic. Um, uh, so people should follow the rules set by that facility. Will Mr. Marae also be classified as setting their own rules? I'm not I. Uh, no, I don't think so, but let me come back to you on that one. Mr. The, uh, the public sector pay freeze was announced almost a year ago, it was May the 5th. Um, should public servants be preparing for it to go into a second year? There's a lot of bargaining going on, and we've got some big bargaining coming up. Um, it is something that we keep under constant review. We are aware of the effects of, you know, inflation, cost of living on uh, on people. Um, I don't have all of the, um, you know, all of the ins and outs of that to, to go into with you today, but uh, it is something that the government keeps under keeps a good look at. Have you received any of the uh, parts or early drafts of the long long service uh, the uh, long term briefings that you set up in the Public Service Act 2020? No. But, that is still too early. Um, I wouldn't expect necessarily to see the drafts. Um, these are not documents that ministers will sign off. These are documents that the public service will be preparing for the parliament. The, the point of the freeze was to bridge that gap between people making less than 60000 and those making more. Have you had any indication over the last 11 months whether that's worked at all? Um, we've seen... I haven't got the latest figures in front of me. What we and, and it's very difficult to to draw accurate conclusions about that because, of course, a lot of the pay increases that have taken place over the last eighteen months to two years were already in train before that guidance was issued. So, if you think about teachers and nurses, for example, they had pay increases already in their collective agreements that were due to come in, um, and I think the last of the teacher ones came into effect this year. Um, either last year or this year. So they would have come in during that time. And so hence, you know, the, the overall trajectory is still been going up. Um, across the time that we've been in government, um, wage growth across the public sector still exceeded inflation up until this year. Now we know that that's going to change. Will you hit a nightclub in Orange? Uh, probably not. Why not? Um, I have two young kids. Would you feel safe to do so? Uh, well, I've had COVID-19 recently, so I'm probably safer than a lot of people. But having said that, um, and I've been fully vaccinated, but having said that, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to spending a bit of time with my family over the Easter break. So, All right, thanks very much, everybody.